The secret of keeping your basil green when you do any type of pesto or puree of basil is to blanch it. Better even, you put it in there about three cups of basil, you put it in the microwave oven for about 30 seconds to blanch it and it's still hot. And then you put salt in it and you put a little bit of Parmesan cheese. I put a good dash of pepper, two or three tablespoons of water. We process it. You know, a little bit of olive oil inside will, of course, make it very glossy and rich, which is what we want. And now I have a beautiful deep green puree of basil. I can serve it as a dip this way, use it as a pesto. Other thing, I mean, if you want to be a bit more extravagant, I do little dice of Swiss cheese, a good emmentaler, you know, or, uh, or gruyere on top of this. Here is what we do, a little tablespoon on top of this. And this is heaven. And you don't have to feel guilty because it only took a minute to make. I'm Jacques Pépin, and this is fast food my way. Happy cooking. Production funding for this series has been brought to you by Cuisinart with the next generation of food processors. From bread dough, to pizza, to stir fries, we do the work to save you time. Cuisinart, the next generation. And by Scharfenberger, makers of fine artisan dark chocolates, recipes available at scharfenberger.com. And by Spectrum Organics, a purveyor of fine culinary oils and condiments, Spectrum, the taste of goodness. And by OXO Good Grips, makers of kitchen tools that make everyday living easier. Okay. You know, when you are well organized, a meal at home doesn't really take much longer to do than to wait in line at the food line or uh, at the takeout deli. So today we're doing a frisé au lardon, which is a curly endive with bacon bits, very specific from Lyon, where I come from. We're gonna do a spaghetti with raw anchovy sauce with tomato in it, and we finish with a great chocolate dessert, chocolate rocher with hazelnut cornflake, and all of that, of course, with a little bit of wine, maybe a little bit of port with it. So let's start with the salad. I cook my bacon in the microwave oven. You know, you cover it with a piece of, uh, with a piece of paper towel, and uh, three, four, five minutes, depending on the size of your bacon, and it's about the best way of doing it. My wife taught me how to do this, you know, so this is always the way I do it. And with the salad, we're going to poached eggs. And I have boiling water here. In your boiling water, you always want to put a little bit of vinegar. It helps the albumin in egg white to cohere together. Well, and what you do, you preferably should have cold eggs, because when it's cold, uh, the egg white is constricted, you know, get together. If it's at room temperature, it tends to go all over the place. Large eggs, always break your eggs on something flat like that so you don't have the shell getting into, into the eggs and break it as close as you can to the water. Now, as it comes to the water, it comes to the top, try to bring back, try to bring back the yolk around the, I mean the white rather, around the yolk. Here is another one, here. And the eggs at that point, I mean the, the, the water at that point sh should boil when you start it. As soon as you put the eggs in it, the water will, will get a bit colder and it should not boil again. Your eggs should push in about, in about 200 degree water. So you can lower the heat and occasionally you test your eggs. It's important at the beginning, as I said, to drag your uh, your slotted spoon on top, it makes the eggs move so it doesn't stick to the bottom. After it moves one, then it's not going to, to stick to the bottom anymore. You know, the old way, the classic way that we used to do in Lyon for eggs, we used to poach eggs, what we call a fried eggs, and a fried is actually an egg which is fried in oil, and that's what I have here. And it's a bit 
It's not done much anymore, but uh, I think the last time that I did it was with Julia. We did those eggs. So you can do only one at a time here. So you break it here and break it as close as you can to the oil. And it starts frying right away. So bring back, bring back the white all around the yolk. That's it. So this is not like poached egg where you can put five, six eggs in your pan. You can only do one at a time here. Right? Wait like a minute on one side. And often those would be served with, uh, with tomato as well, you know, like with um, uh, a grilled tomato, grilled bacon. Okay, so this was the fried eggs that I used to do as a kid. And the inside of that egg would be basically, you know, all liquid like a poached egg. It was the proper way of doing it. Okay, so you check occasionally to see if your egg is, uh, is ready. Lift it up and you can press with your finger on top of it. It should be quite soft if you want it to be run inside. And the eggs are always placed in cold water. You place them in cold water to wash up the vinegar as well as to cool them up so that you can reheat them whenever you're ready. So that's one way of doing the eggs. Okay, so now with our salad, we're going to do a dressing. And the dressing will be made of garlic. Separate the clove of garlic here. I need one good clove of garlic. Cut the end of the stem. Crush the garlic so the, the flesh will come out easily. And then crush it into a puree. You want to do a nice puree here of garlic. So this is your classic mustard vinaigrette with garlic, salt, fair amount of cracked paper, and vinegar, red wine vinegar conventionally, mustard, always put mustard in there, and of course your olive oil. And at that point, of course, the best possible olive oil will make the best possible salad. That you can do ahead. I often do that in a jar. I take a jar, put my mustard in it, put the garlic, put everything, shake the jar, and take whatever I need and keep the rest in the refrigerator. You know? Okay, let's taste it. Always taste. Mm, that's good. I have the frisé here, and those frisé, we have them coming now, as you can see. The salad is green to start with, and when you close, my father used to close his salad or put a, power pa a, a flower pot on top of it. And when it's deprived of photosynthesis of the sun, then it turns white like that inside. So conventionally, you trim a little bit of the green if you want. Those are pretty expensive, but I have some in my garden. And then you cut them into pieces, fill up with water, and this, of course, is the greatest thing to clean up uh, your salad. You even have a break here. Because if you don't do this, it is likely that you'll have three or four or five tablespoons of water which are mixing with your dressing. And that really can kill your dressing, your salad. Okay, so now we mix. That well is the type of salad that you can even mix a little bit ahead because it tends to, uh, to be tough, you know. So here is frisé au lardon. Here I am. I'm making a mess here. I don't know if you've noticed, but you can mix the salad in any bowl. The bowl is never big enough when you mix the salad. Here we are. 
and nifty portion of salad here on the first course. And the bacon on top that you break into pieces here. You can also, of course, do the bacon. My mother would do the bacon in a skillet, of course. Microwave oven didn't exist at that point. Crouton. Have some crouton with saute in olive oil. And of course, you have your poached eggs. And the poached eggs, if I took it just out, oh, it's still lukewarm anyway, just out of the water, you may clean a little bit of the white around and then serve your eggs on top. And very often, even, even break your eggs so it run onto your salad when you serve it. That's a, this is the classic salad lyonnaise, you know, the frise au lardon. And Differently than other salad, you usually serve that salad on a lukewarm plate and you serve it with a cold wine. And usually it's a cold Beaujolais. The Beaujolais, as you know, is pressed in a, in a, in a different way, so there is not much, of, uh, not much tannin in it, and that's why very often it is served cold, almost like a white wine. So cold Beaujolais on a warm salad plate, it's a bit unusual, but this is the way the salad is served in Lyon with the Beaujolais. Okay, and now we're going to do the spaghetti with the raw anchovy sauce. And this is something that I do often at home because uh, it's easy to do and I can do it ahead. I have boiling water here, salted boiling water. I'm, go I'm gonna put a pound of uh, spaghetti here and those are thin spaghetti, so they will take about seven, eight minutes to do. When you put your pasta in here, make sure to spread it out so it doesn't stick together. Good. And now you don't have to cover it anymore. So in that sauce, I'm going to mix together peas. And those are frozen baby peas which have been defrosted. I have some anchovy filet here that I'm going to, uh, about half a can, about five or six anchovy filet, cut into small pieces. I do a bunch of different sauce like this at home. The most classic maybe, the sauce, which is the real uh, pasta primavera. Also. From my friend Ed, Ed Joby, the professional painter in New York, and in, uh, I think it was 1976 when CIO opened uh, Le Cirque in New York, uh, he asked Ed, I was around too, do you have a new idea, you know, to do a pasta very simple uh, that we could do at the restaurant? And Ed said, well, my mother or my grandmother always made that pasta primavera in spring which was done very simply by cutting tomato. But I'm going to cut tomato here. So we cut those tomato, and I do that at home when my garden is full of tomato, one of the recipes we do. So you cut your tomato into inch dice, and you put olive oil on top of it, salt, pepper, and that's about it. And uh, cook the pasta, like, a, like a, a, an olive oil on it, of course, so it's like a, a, a tomato salad if you want. And then the pasta come out boiling up, you pour it on top of it, toast it and serve it with some cheese and basil on top, you know. That was the real pasta primavera. Since, since then it went into a lot of different variation with all kinds of different vegetables. So it's a little bit of the same idea than this, but this I keep everything uncooked, raw. So here I have enough tomato. Put it this way. So, cheese. I'm gonna put some tomato, some uh, flake here. You know, pepper flake, salt, pepper, fair amount of pepper, and then some garlic. The garlic, I'm going to crush it too. Maybe two cloves of garlic should be more than enough here. Yeah. 
Okay. And I'll put some herbs on top. In that case, I'm going to put some cilantro, but of course, parsley, basil, any one you like would be fine. And you put your oil in it, and a fair amount of oil, as you can see. And you stir this. And that's it. I do that ahead. Now, you don't want that to be ice cold when you put your pasta in it. So when I'm ready to serve it, any of those sauce, just when my spaghetti are basically cooked, I throw this in the microwave oven for a couple of minutes. Not really to cook it, but to have it all lukewarm so that it doesn't cool off the pasta so much. So I'm going to put that in the microwave. Okay, this should be ready now. That's it. Well, see, it's lukewarm, just the way it should be. Always take a little bit of the pasta water that I use in there, you know. Always take like a good half a cup, even three quarters of a cup of the pasta water I mix with the mixture. Then drain the pasta. I'm going to drain it well, directly into the mixture here. Okay. Probably a little more olive oil on top. And we can toss this. Pasta. I don't know anyone who doesn't like pasta. So it's always the greatest when it's done, you know, at the last moment like this. Except this one, the sauce is done ahead. So, I have some cheese in there already. I'll put this in a nice, beautiful bowl here. And maybe with a little bit of uh, extra cheese on top. That thing is really great to make flake of cheese like this. I'm gonna put a bit of cilantro here. Doesn't really, really even need it. But I like the taste of cilantro. So here it is. A spaghetti with raw anchovy sauce. You know, when my granddaughter comes for Christmas, sorry, this is what I'm known for. The chocolate rocher with hazelnut and cornflake. Of course, she makes it with me and she has chocolate all over her face, all over the place, but it's a great, great dessert to do and very, very easy to do. I mean, make sure you use a very high 70, 80 percent cocoa butter chocolate. Yeah. I use a dark one. Of course, I use uh, milk chocolate as well. I don't really use white chocolate much because for me, I don't really feel it's chocolate. But uh, it's fine with it too. So what you do, you melt your chocolate. You can melt it on top of uh, hot water. Sometimes I put it directly in the microwave oven. Don't cook it too long in the microwave oven because it will really have a tendency to scorch at 45 seconds. Leave it two, three minutes. Look around, do it another 30, 30 seconds. Do that a couple of times and it's going to be nice and beautiful. So here I have roasted hazelnut. I, 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 uh, I uh, rub them together to remove some of the, the, the shell, but even if some of the shell are on, it's fine. So you put a little bit of, uh, of chocolate here with your um, hazelnut. That's it. There is nothing like hazelnut and chocolate. And with this, you know, very simply, you do a little package like this. I mean, certainly for Christmas, this is the type of thing that we do at home. We do peeled, uh, peeled of orange, peeled of grapefruit that we crystallize, chocolate truffle, chocolate rocher, all of those small desserts that sometimes we put in a little package uh, with a bow and all that that we give our friend when they come home, you know when they come for a PIT or for whatever. So here is with the hazelnut. 
right? You can do them as big as you want. And then, well, I'll use the same bowl. I love it with cornflake. And the cornflake turned out really nice and crunchy too. So, you know, again, your dark chocolate. A bit of mixture. Don't worry if you, if you break the cornflake a little bit. It's okay. They still stay very, very crunchy. You want them to be coated totally with the chocolate. And this, maybe a little more. A dash more. Chocolate is always messy. All the chocolate, all the chocolatier pastry chef that I know, the greatest one, Albert Cumin. I remember going trout fishing with him. Coming out of his car, he had chocolate on my butt. Anywhere you want with him, you had chocolate on yourself. Okay, so here again, here is those large rochers that we do with the cornflake. Look at that. Tell you the kid will love that. And the adult too, actually. All right. They can be separated a little bit. Spread them, uneven, bigger, smaller one. It really takes no time to do. All you need is, as I say, the nuts, different type of nuts, this, a good quality chocolate, and here you are. So that's it, you put that in the refrigerator, and it will set up in no time at all. Another thing that we do there, See the little fancier, you take those little um, those little uh, muffin pan like this, and inside we roll a little bit of chocolate. I mean the value may be of uh, a good table one two tablespoons of chocolate cover the bottom. This can make a finish a great finish to a, a fancy dinner, you know. And into this now, I love to fill those with fresh raspberry, you know. So you set your raspberry in when it's still liquid. Okay. Another one. Now you can do all kind of other things in there as I have here. And as you see here, I have Sultana raisins, you know, the, the golden raisins. We have macadamia nuts, which are really good. All that will go well with it. Uh, dry cranberry I have here. That's great too. You want to gild the lily a little bit. You know you're going to serve it pretty fast. You know, within a couple of hours, you can put a, a thing of mint in the center of it. The mint will set in it too, and the mint, mint and chocolate goes well too. And that's about it. It's really not complicated to do and you really impress the neighbor here. Okay, here we are. That goes into the refrigerator also. And when you are ready, when you are ready, you see you can, this will come out very easily. You know, from around. And here we are. Here we are with this. And with this one is the dark chocolate. This is a dark chocolate with the, with the roasted hazelnut. And underneath you have the cornflake. Here I have almond, almond with the milk chocolate. You know, roasted almond as well. And here I have a Reese crispy. Love Reese crispy with it too. And what's better than chocolate to a nice old vintage port that goes so well with it. I'm going to taste it, taste the port, simple dishes, quickly prepared, means that you can spend more time conversing with family and friends. Happy cooking! Visit our website at kqed.org slash morefastfoodmyway to learn more about Jacques Pepin. 
You can watch shows online, view extra clips of Jacques in the Kitchen, print selected recipes from the series, and meet some of the people behind the scenes. Call 1-800-937-5387 or log on to channel9store.com to order the book with over 100 recipes and color photographs for $32 plus shipping or to order the complete series of all 26 shows on DVD for $39.99 plus shipping. Production funding for this series has been brought to you by Cuisinart with the next generation of food processors. From bread dough, to pizza, to stir fries. We do the work to save you time. Cuisinart, the next generation. And by Scharfenberger, makers of fine artisan dark chocolates, recipes available at scharfenberger.com. And by Spectrum Organics, a purveyor of fine culinary oils and condiments, Spectrum, the taste of goodness. And by OXO Good Grips, makers of kitchen tools that make everyday living easier. KQED Television Production.